Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. All right, Rachel, I have a very simple question for you. You ready? Sure. All right. Does your life make sense? I mean, honestly, I kind of want to say, yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I want to know how come. Because the, the question that uh, that beginning uh, it moves toward is I'm – I'm aware we're coming up to the school's 25th anniversary. That's one example. And then um, uh, recently, Becky and I lost a very dear friend. Um, and in that death, uh, it's prompted a, a lot of stories. But what I think I've found is uh, we're all, you know, I mean, if we begin to talk about how many stories actually are we it's millions. Mm -hmm. And it, it, even though I was part uh, with a number of others of the start of Mars Hill that eventually became the Seattle School, uh, with regard to our friend Len, there are just so many stories. And yet what I find is they're almost disparate. It's mm -hmm. like uh, it, 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 largely like here's a story, here's another story. And I kind of know that my life has a certain sense ability, a certain thematic consistency, but I think I'm more aware right now of mm. just how like scattered uh, at least my stories are. Now, that might be largely uh, because of the reality of trauma mm. that death brings. Mm. Um, but I think that's what I'm, I'm wanting at least for us to engage. How do we connect stories in a way that allows the stories to, to connect mm -hmm. versus like Becky has, I don't know how many freaking volumes of pictures, but they're all time related. They're not. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I have like a, yeah, I have like a bin that is like chronological, but it's like, what are the stories? And they're all random, you know, like, yeah. So I, I yeah, the, <clears throat> the only thing that links them is they're in 1982, but <laughs> There has to be something more with regard to our ability to connect stories. So that's what I want us to to ponder. So when I say to you, does your make life make sense? Do your stories feel? And again, I'm not saying every story, but enough connection that you'd go, oh, I see some really significant themes being played out. Yeah, and I think that's probably why I would say yes, but that has not always been the case. And and it's not always the case, but I would say I've been so privileged to do enough story work over the past, oh gosh, 16 years and 17 years <laughs> that there is enough of like, a, even if I'm caught off guard in the moment, I can be like, oh, there's a familiarity here. Or even if a story is really absurd, there's enough thematic sense of my absurdity and weirdness to be able to go, oh, of course this is happening to you. Or of course this is a story you're collecting of your life. But that has not always been the case. And I do remember a very distinct season when I came to Marshall Graduate School, now the Seattle School, that, that in many ways I was pursuing a Master of Divinity. But my heart questions, my my, the cry of my heart was, help me make sense of this life. I'm so like lost in a sea of confusion and, and kind of feeling at the mercy of these stories and, and so unsure of how they're connected and how they have impacted me. And who am I? <laughs> that question of like, who am I? And how did this come to be? So I've definitely, that still feels so close, that sense of the disconnection. There's something about, again, dailiness and something about space, time and space that organizes a lot of what we do. As I look at my calendar and we're looking at doing a podcast today, um, it, it organizes without actually creating synthetic, connected themes to be able to see 
a, a sense of both the depth of those life stories, but also their breadth. Yeah. So I, I let's just start with this question. Uh, and I know it's a big one that we'll spend a good portion of our time on, but like, how did you begin making connections that aren't just time and space bound? Well, I mean, this is a, a little bit of a complex question because of my kind of orientation and location in, in, in the priestly realm, because stories for me, I mean, I was always in a story and um, looking to this story of God. And I do think for me initially making sense of my story did start with this kind of engagement with these stories of God and and feeling resonance in places where I connected. Now, the uh, the fl shadow side of that is that I also had a lot of stories that felt like, well, this doesn't fit within the story of God, at least the way the story of God was being told to me. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do with those stories? You know, you kind of just have to like banish them off. So I think for me, it was being invited, one, to actually acknowledge I do have, I hold many stories that have that hold meaning that have impacted me, that have shaped me. And so it really did start um, like that kind of true. Well, I mean, even in college, I was just talking to someone about this the other day. I had to take this class called Western Civilization. And so even like thinking about these collective stories, these larger stories. And I remember being like, wait, there's a Western Civilization. <laughs> like we don't all have the same story that has shaped us like the larger story like there's different large stories that like impact how we see the world and understand the world and make sense of the world like that blew my mind but so when I came to the Seattle school like I had this kind of biblical studies sociology anthropology right those are like the stories of our culture the stories of humanity the biblical stories I did not have any psychology or um, kind of therapeutic frame in my education. So being invited to understand like, oh, my deeply personal particular stories matter and have and and reveal something that's not just like they're happening to me. They're connected to all these other stories and they reveal something. So honestly, the biggest kind of first like, oh, my stories, two two things I would say like, I would always refer to myself as just an incredibly anxious person. Like it's just like a personality trait. And so being invited to start to tell the stories that shaped my anxious body and why I struggled with anxiety was like a huge revelation. The other piece was I, I came to seminary, see myself as a helper. Like I'm a helper. It's what I do. And that's just how, who God made me. Like I'm just helpful and I, and people need me. And and then I remember like my first attempt to actually be helpful in a story group flopped majorly and I wanted to crawl in a hole and die. And the facilitator just simply said something like, you know, Rachel, are you aware that there are stories that have shaped why you feel like you have to be helpful at all times and why it feels terrifying when you're not? Mm -hmm. Do you want to look at like, do you want to actually start telling those stories or even being curious about what are those stories. Um, so I'd say those were the two kind of entry points for me contending with my anxiety and contending with this part of me that I was actually very proud of, but was also slowly killing me. I mean, when I came to the Seattle school, I was very burnt out. I was coming out of youth ministry. I, you know, there was just a lot there. And so I think that's how it started for me. Yeah, that's so crucial. Like, just to underscore that you're you're looking at a quality. Uh, and again, it may feel more like a burden, but the quality of, I, I'm anxious. But I'm also somebody who loves and feels driven or called to help. Just simple words that I think any human being can come to a initial statement of, this is how I seem to be in the world. But operating then with that next question of what stories may have shaped this becoming of a trait, uh, I just think it's crucial. I think for me, what's even most recent, uh, a matter of the last couple months, is a good, good friend said, 
uh, you know, do you do you use the noun writer about yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you a writer? And I so quickly, even though I thought I had done this work well before, I said, nah, guy, I write. That's a verb, but I'm not a writer. And uh, thankfully, he pressed in a little bit more to the question of how come? I mean, you are a writer. And I'm going, no, I'm not a writer. Like, C.S. Lewis is a writer. Flannery O'Connor is a writer. My dear friend Tremper Longman is a writer. I'm not a writer. I write. And, you know, again, he pressed a couple more times. And I told him the story of fourth grade Miss Worth standing over me, long, bony finger, mm. and snarling at me. You will amount to nothing because you can't spell. And I've always thought, uh, again, you know, that was a bad moment. I mean, it confirmed mm. something mm. I intuitively thought to be true, and right. that was I'm stupid. Mm. And not only I'm stupid, but I have no future given the reality of. So as we were talking about that, one of the questions he said was, I know one story can shape a whole life. I know that. But are there other stories mm. that deepen it mm. and broaden it. And just that simple phrase, deepen it and broaden it. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And again, like most of us, I, I was like totally blank for, I don't know, a while. And another story slipped in. And that's, I, I ended up freshman year of college, Ah, not really planning to go. It's too long a story, but I ended up being accepted to a nice school uh, only because I played football. And uh, Tremper, who was already planning to go to that school, contacted the coach, made an interview, created a context, uh, even though my grades were so pathetic and my SAT um, beyond impossible that mm. anybody could get it that low. I still got in. But within a really short period of time, and this is what came back to memory, was within a really short period of time, I was sent to a remedial writing course mm -hmm. and a remedial speech course. And in both cases, I lasted only a week before both professors, even though it was their responsibility to keep me in for a semester, both of them looked at me and said, I'm sure they had no contact, but they said, um, look, I can't be of help to you. I can't. Y your language is so disjointed. We really can't help. And your writing impossible. It makes no sense at all. Uh, mm. Just never get a job. And that was the phrase. Never get a mm. job that requires you speak or write. Wow. Further wow. deepening confirmation. So even though, uh, I, obviously, I've somehow matriculated educationally, nonetheless, when asked that question, are you a writer? Ha the haunting, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of what we're inviting one another to is, what, what stories have haunted you, even with the reality of lots and lots of experiences that contravene, contradict what we would have known at a certain point. And it was only when I began to make those connections to those stories that the lie, again, I have enough data, but something of that deep internal lie could begin to be engaged in a new way. So connecting stories, we're really saying isn't uh, like having a, uh, you know, an album of photos that you can look at and go, this story happened, this story happened, but where you really do have a theme book that you can look at and say, this has confirmed certain lies, this has confirmed and opened the door to certain realities that are lovely. So I'm, I'm curious what you're doing with those stories. Oh, I mean, ultimately, they're my first ex experience is just it's heartbreaking to me. And then it's that leap of, of the absurdity that they've held so much haunting. And of course they have, because 
even when you say like, oh, no, I'm not a writer. And I am I found myself counting like how many books have you written? It's kind of where I went. And then thinking about just how if I didn't know these were your story. I mean, they, they are stories that do not actually fit with how I experience you and how I know you to be. And it's making me think. And isn't that the why we have to get into them and the haunting of them because no amount of, well, Dan, you've written this many books and look at your life. Like you speak and teach and write for a living. Like that's what you do. And like, and actually like you, you know, you wield language better than most people I know. And that's why people want to come do therapy with you. And you see so well, it's like no amount of praising your gifting or even taking you to like facts that contradict your felt sense actually bring about the kind of freedom and change that we long for so i find myself to be honest with you i find myself taking great hope in the reality that this story work like it's not like we reach an end to it or that jesus stops revealing places that were meant for more freedom and so i i simultaneously feel like such grief and sorrow that these are still places that haunt you but also deep gratitude that there's more invitation to go deeper and to connect the dots of how these have come to be stories that still hold sway over your heart, mind, and body. Yeah. The haunting, I still would argue, is really the context for something very holy to happen. Because I have named myself. Uh, you know, yeah. well prior to this yes. as a writer. And yet the question when it came in the context, uh, I just had a hard time saying it. But in the beginning process of being invited again to both that depth and breadth, like other stories, like thank you for this story. And it is enough. Nonetheless, that idea of a heartbreaking, haunting story likely has siblings uh, or at least family members yeah. that may be a year or five or 10 beyond. And I think that's often where we don't make connection mm -hmm. to see, in some sense, not merely the star, but the constellation. Yeah. And where you begin to see the constellation of stories that have this imprint, that indeed have that haunting, I, I think it's the context of where the spirit is going to be knocking on the door. And it may take, for someone like me, like a lot of, a lot of the knocking to be in a position where I go, oh, like I had not thought about those college stories I don't think you've ever heard. I no, mean, I heard never. Probably. No, never. I've heard the elementary school one, but no, no not the college one. I've heard seminary ones, yep. but not not the college. Yeah. Right. And in some measure, it's so shameful mm. to be thrown out of remedial classes. Just to be in a remedial class is not exactly one of the great honors of life. But in that, to be taken to a point of both the irony and absurdity, as you put it, yeah, I've got enough data. This is what I've been doing for decades. Well, I'm even thinking about like in our trainings, you know, we create like a creative expression that like articulates our sense of calling. And even in your creative expression, <laughs> there is a writer <laughs> you know, named as a part of your calling. But I think that's what I'm saying is like, we can even come to a place of owning this to be true for us and still need more freedom yeah. Well, and to me, at least, what what we're beginning to say is that much of this is spirit work. Yeah. This is where we need to be continually opening the conversation with the Spirit of God of, show me, mm -hmm. reveal my heart, reveal what is, in some sense, binding, uh, but also what is opening mm -hmm. uh, to the process of me becoming more of who I'm meant to be and to be able to name myself accurately before the living God. Mm -hmm. So that process of once the spirit begins to do the work, I think there is a sense in which, like, I don't think I would have come to those stories without a friend setting the stage, right, right. being able to go like, like just the question, uh, do you see yourself to be a writer? 
Um, I think most people would presume, given what you were putting words to, that I've written a few books, that the answer is, well, of course. Mm -hmm. Like, w w w how crazy uh, to even ask something as obvious. But I think that's where both the spirit, but also good friendships, good, caring engagement always begins with that curiosity of, can I... And again, it's almost like, can I hover like a drone? Not the best image, but can I just look from above and sort of look at the tapestry or the geography of your life and come into it with, you know, a curiosity? And that, I think, is, that is damnable rare. Um, I just wish, you know, that that gift of being curious about one another uh, was a daily phenomenon yeah. in all relationships. And yeah. it is just not. Yes, that is very true. So that calling of being invited to a story, again, I want to use the word, there has to be a depth to it. Mm -hmm. And depth always includes what's the setting. That's the idea of, can I see like a drone over your world, see the larger playground, and yet always has that movement into who are the characters? And, you know, my good friend said to me, what do you remember about those mm -hmm. two teachers? And I'm like, oh, as soon as he asked that, I was like, I'm done. I, like, I don't want to go back to, I can see the classroom. Yeah. I can barely see the professor, but I, I can remember being called to the desk and literally only person in the whole class being called up for this dismissal. So when we begin to engage a story, who are the characters? What's the setting? What's the plot? And can you remember any of the dialogue. And even if you can't quote unquote remember, what's the likely dialogue that occurred? Uh, it, facial, nonverbal, mm -hmm. the, the verbal. Uh, can you begin to, in one sense, let your heart dip into, like get into the water and it will be either uh, cold and icy or overwhelmingly hot. Doubt it will be tepid. And there will be that sense of, I don't want to stay in this. But that is part of story connection is, will you get in to the story? And like you said, that work, I love the language of it's going to either be hot or cold and you're not going to want to stay in it long. Um, and I think it's because these are often places and you put words to it that are so deeply connected to where we ha are really bound by shame where we feel contemptuous towards those those parts of our like not just the people in the story but our our character in the story whatever age we are what our what our face looks like and when i'm doing this work with people often i will ask what do you feel toward that fourth grader what do you feel towards that college student um and it is just so revelatory because again the nature of this kind of connecting the dots is not just a, oh, well, that's, oh, it's good to remember that story, how it really happened. It's actually so deeply revelatory about our current warfare and struggles with our own self, with our relationships with others, where there is debris and heartbreak. And so they just, they're revelatory in a kind of way that can be simultaneously in the depths, so relieving because we feel less crazy, but that relief only lasts for a minute <laughs> <laughs> Yes, when we realize like, oh, like I, like I've got to actually spend time. Like this is not going to be a once one entrance into the depth and then like, that's it. And that's all I have to do. And I think that I say this a lot to people like healing takes time. And it, these stories are worthy of tending to over long seasons and almost like cyclically, right? Like my guess is entering that fourth grade story with this connection to another story is then a deeper, like it's, it's another invitation to, even if it's a story you've spent time in, it's like, sometimes there's more and we come back again and again and again. And, and I, as you said, like the depth and the breadth, like why we don't just stop with that one story. We kind of have to see, especially ones that haunt us, what are the other stories? 
yes. Yes. And and in that other stories, like uh, my good friend, basically, as I began telling him the freshman year uh, experience, uh, he said, I'm curious, because I was obviously making connection between these stories. He said, well, how did you, do you have a sense of what happened like after you walked out of each of those different classrooms. And I went, oh, I I mean, I'm sure, I don't remember the particularity, but I was stoned for days. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, in one sense, I obliterated the experience of shame by risky, dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, foolish behavior. And he goes... What do, you, what do you think you did as a fourth grader? Because you probably didn't have the option at that point. You weren't you weren't drinking at that point. And I'm like, no, nah, that would be nine. No, um, probably no drugs. No, of course not. I wonder what you did at that point. And the moment he asked that wow. question, it was like, oh, I remember going to the playground and making a fool of myself. Um, oh. And and he's like, oh, so you have always handled shame by increasing your shame. Uh, and I'm like, oh shit, I'm done. Thank you, friend. I, this, is just, this is just not a conversation I thought we were going to begin to have. And when you begin to feel the clench, you begin to hear something inside of you going, I'm out of here, I'm done. Let, let's, let's, there's too much, if we can use the word here, too much meaning, too much sense mm -hmm. going on. Then you kind of know the proverbial uh, being painted in a corner by the goodness of God uh, mm -hmm. is at play. And at least for me, uh, what he was naming is you get dangerous, you get crazy, you create incredible foolishness in order to escape feeling like a fool mm -hmm. because at least there you, chose you have some degree of control mm -hmm. so breath <laughs> <laughs> breath is always mm -hmm. going to take us into themes that may look like they're i don't know four or five thousand feet above ground level but it's like where the currents are significantly at play. What have you found when you step into thematic matters with regard to your stories? Oh, look, I just even listening to you, I have to like practice deep breathing. <laughs> because I, it's like, again, it's back to that. Like when we are caught, caught and we get to, we're seen and known for, for a moment in a way that like, is not just like, oh, we knew this about ourselves and we were just waiting for someone to see it and name it. It is like a homecoming to ourselves in that moment. Like, yes, this is, yes, this is so true. Like, how have I not seen this before? Or maybe I've seen this before, but I kind of forgot. And now I'm, I'm back to remembering this is a core struggle of mine. It both can be true. Um, it's, it's. It, it, it's like a simultaneous experience for me of, of just, again, deep relief because I long to be known. I long to be healed deep terror, because to be honest, when stories, when, when you can kind of isolate a story is like, Oh, this was just like a one-off weird thing that happened to me. Um, when it becomes thematic and we have to reckon with one, our po own powerlessness to actually stop something from happening and, or our own, like collusion with something that keeps it happening um so that yes. you know like you said so we can maintain some sense of control like i was thinking oh i totally was more like you know it wasn't so much like oh foolishness it was like oh you're crazy you're too serious you know so then it was like oh you think i'm crazy you think i'm crazy i will oh if you want to see crazy you know like i will give you crazy like that way, if you kind of 
now don't want me, I at least can feel like, yeah, that was legitimately crazy. So, so many of my stories are getting into the stories and realizing, oh, I was actually quite stunning. And in, in the initial moment, there was something really beautiful. There was something really lovely about my voice. It wasn't disgusting and annoying, but the way I dealt with the rejection or the violence was totally like, oh, I must've been so obnoxious or I spoke out of line or, you know, I'm not feminine enough or, um, you know, I was, I don't know, you know, I was crazy or whatever, because again, it feels like I can tolerate the leaving more if that's true. So then we get into the debris. Yes. Get into oh, the debris. goodness. And as we started with the Holy Spirit and this invitation of the Spirit, the debris is not just emotional. It's not just physical. It's also deeply spiritual. Yes. Well, and debris is what I think most of us want to hide in our most desperate efforts to look okay or to look far better than okay. Mm -hmm. And yet there's something about coming into the wreckage, the, the heartache that is so counterintuitive as let's get it cleaned up. Let's, let's get it done and resolve versus can we walk in these ancient areas mm -hmm. and know that in some sense there was a civilization mm -hmm. uh, before we were our age, we were young. And in that, what does it mean to honor? Mm -hmm. And again, not bless the harm and not That's bless right. having been abused, but bless that there is uh, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. There are trauma responses that indeed have increased something of our own debris. Mm -hmm. But in the initial uh, moments uh, of our heartache or of the loss or the shame, they, they kept us alive. They were life-giving moments for us that enabled us to get from those periods to where we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it is easy as it is for me to say to a client or to a friend, yeah, when it's back to look at the man in the mirror, what does it mean for me to bless, in this case, um, something of the absurd, beautiful irony that something in me, even though I don't remember this at all, something in me essentially said, I will write, mm -hmm. I will speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and though you wouldn't have known that for many years after those experiences, can I um, join and bless the irony that what evil intended for harm, mm -hmm. there is something, again, a lot of debris still, but something to be blessed in the process of the defiance to continue a path that would not have been predicted on the basis of a fourth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there is... Uh, again, not a bow to wrap up our time, but a, a sense that the resurrection really is irony. Mm. Um, it, it is the mockery of death, that death, you do not get the final word. Fourth grade teachers who are brutal, you don't get the final word. And in that process, I don't think we can come to engaging, naming, and resisting the urge to clean the debris up, but actually sit in the debris, sit in the ashes, and to know that there is something in the ashes that will be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org.